It was in the springtime, in the time of year when kings go out to do battle, and David was in trouble, real trouble. Late one afternoon, he decided to take a stroll around the perimeter of his rooftop when his eye chanced upon the form of a beautiful woman. And in that moment, David had no intention of committing any scandalous sin. But soon he would give way to a deadly temptation that would plunge his household into grief. Let me remind you of how the story happened. If you have a Bible, you might turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's a familiar story, but some of the details perhaps have missed us. And the scripture begins by saying, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. And as the story continues, uh, David summoned Uriah home, hoped that he would go into his wife, and when he didn't, got him drunk, hoped he would go into his wife then. When he still refused, David sent him back into battle, carrying what amounted to his own death warrant. And at the end of all of that, we read these words in verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan, now reading from chapter 12 to David, he came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Now, if you had witnessed David's rise to power, you never would have expected him to become a murderer or an adulterer. This was the kind of man that mothers hope their daughters will marry, that fathers would hope to have for a son. David was called by God from a young age. He was strengthened by faith. We see him striding out to face Goliath in battle when Goliath had mocked the name of the living God. And David was armed with only a, a slingshot and a few choice stones and a mighty faith in the power of God. David was easy to love. In fact, his name means beloved. King Saul loved him, at least at first. Jonathan loved him, even though he would take the kingdom of his father. Michael loved David too, Jonathan's sister. In fact, she's the first, perhaps the only woman in the Bible who is said in so many words to love a man. 
People of Israel loved David. They sang his praises. The Lord loved David. He was a man after God's own heart. David had all of these things going for him. He was exuberant with praise. He was the sweet singer of Israel, as we will hear this morning. His lyrical ballads became the songs that people sang when they worshiped their God. The Lord is my shepherd, David sang. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I have set the Lord always before me. I shall not be shaken. These are the songs of David. Surely such a man would be safe from any great danger. And yet I tell you, David was in trouble. Listen, you can be called by God and loved by God and still come under sudden attack. You can, you can trust in God and fight for God and sing praise to God and still give in to some deadly temptation. If it happened to somebody as seemingly untouchable as David, surely it could also happen to you. We are as blessed as David was, if not more so, loved by our Father God with the gift of faith by the Holy Spirit, called by Jesus Christ himself into the service of his kingdom. We gather regularly to sing God's praises. We're with the people of God every day. Do you think somehow that we might therefore be safe? We are not safe. We are in constant danger. The scripture says, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Our enemy is constantly looking for some opportunity to, to destroy us. And maybe it is those times when we think that we are safe, that we are in most in danger. I wonder, have you considered what temptations you may face today? You surely will face them. We are all tempted. I like the words of Thomas Akempis who said, we are never secure from temptations as long as we live because the source of them is from within ourselves. And so the question is, are you ready to face those temptations or are you in as much trouble as David was when he got up from his couch and went out to take a walk on the roof of his palace? Now, I do wanna say a few things this morning about what David did wrong and what happened afterwards, but I particularly want you to notice what David didn't do. You know, sometimes when we are struggling with a particular sin, perhaps some sin of sexual temptation, we focus on not doing something. So whether it's not criticizing or not binging or not taking whatever impure pleasure we are tempted to take, we focus on not doing that thing. That's our big concern and prayer request. And of course, there is a big place in life for not doing things that are not pleasing to God. The Bible does, after all, say, thou shalt not, and it says it more than once. But notice that what first got David into trouble was not something he did, it was something he didn't do. You see, at this time when kings were supposed to go out to battle, David sent Joab and he sent his servants and he sent all Israel, the scripture says, but he is back sitting on his couch. The Bible never wastes a detail and these details are indictments. Kings were supposed to go out and do their royal duty. David had retreated to his palace. He had, he had stopped serving. He had stopped sacrificing his life for others. And in case there's any doubt about this interpretation, the Bible reiterates, it says it not once, but twice in verse one of chapter 11, David remained at Jerusalem. Note this, mark this. He was not doing what he was supposed to do and he wasn't in the place where he was supposed to be. There's a sense here, very strong sense of self-indulgence, of the laziness that comes from success, a sense of entitlement. David could no longer be bothered with the hard work of defending his kingdom. And is it really surprising then that such self-indulgence would lead to greater transgression? Let's not miss the opportunity to examine our own lives, we who live in such ease 
It's worth considering this morning, what are some of the things that you are not doing that you should do and that might lead you to do things that you never plan to do and maybe don't even want to do? But it really starts from a failure to do the things that God is calling us to do. Some of these things are very familiar. They're easy to overlook. But I want you to remind, I want to remind you of them. Because if you're not doing some of these things, you may be in much more trouble than you realize. Let me just ask a few simple questions to get at this. I wonder, have you, have you been in conversation with God this morning? Or is prayer one of those things that you're not doing so much? You know, Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray so that they would not fall into temptation. And so are we people of prayer? And if not, how do we expect to stay out of the kind of trouble that David got himself into? Here's another question. Are you feeding on the word of God? I use the word feeding, not simply reading, because I'm, I'm talking about something more than simple reading. I'm talking about drawing daily nourishment so that you are meditating on the promises of God and have a sense of what he is calling you to do in the world. Are you actively engaged in worship? The Holy Spirit calls us to be present in worship, not merely occupying space, but giving mind and heart and soul to the honor and majesty of our Savior. Another thing God is calling us to do is our daily work. God has given each person, I believe, a main calling in life. For you right now, that happens to be the calling of a student. And so are you giving your best to this main calling that God has for you? Or is something else getting in the way? Maybe, maybe even something not wrong in itself. I was trying to think of what examples would be for this campus. Netflix, maybe, League of Legends, I don't know. Things not, not wrong in themselves, but permissible things that easily get in the way of what is vital. And you may end up like David, getting off your couch and into trouble because you're not doing some of the things that you ought to be doing when and where you are supposed to be doing them. These are the kinds of questions we should be asking ourselves, particularly if we're struggling with a particular sin in our lives and that has become a focus and yet there are all of these other things that God wants us to give ourselves to and as we give ourselves to those things, we experience his grace for all of life. Understand this about sexual sin specifically, it is never just a matter of sex. It is always connected to the rest of life. I can't help but wonder if David had been living for others instead of himself, maybe he could have kept his desire under the power of love. But that's not how David was living. And it was at this time when he was in such trouble from the danger of deadly temptation that he caught a glimpse of this beautiful woman. That glimpse, if that was all that David had done, would not have been brought him, made him guilty of any sin, but David did so much more than that. His glance became a gaze. Frankly, he looked her up and down and started thinking about what he would like to do with her. And from this point on, the rest of the story unfolds like the, the slow motion replay of a train wreck. You've seen it before and you can hardly bear to, to look, but you, you watch it again, hoping somehow that things might be different this time. But of course, it turns out exactly the same way every time you read it. If only David had turned away. In the anatomy of temptation, the eye is a window to the heart. And so one way to gain victory over sexual sin is to turn away that lusty gaze. Godly men and women have always understood that this requires modesty in the way that we dress and also wisdom in what we choose to look at and keep looking at. It's not surprising the kind of language, the metaphoric language that the Bible uses if you understand how this temptation works. The, the Apostle Peter wisely warns against having what he calls eyes full of adultery. And maybe you know Job's remedy for a lust-free life. I have made a covenant with my eyes, he said, not to look lustfully at a girl. Has that ever been more important than it is today? 
when there are sexual images everywhere we look, we are, we are living in a, what one has called a pornotopia, a place where porn is the norm, and we are all in danger. Pornography denigrates women and men, damages relationships, destroys our spiritual ability to lead. The Puritan Thomas Watson, and yes, even the Puritans had things to say on this subject, he rightly said that sexual pictures secretly convey poison to the heart. It's not just the heart that's affected. If you know anything of the research of our own Bill Struthers, you know how pornography also affects the brain. I encourage you to, to look at his book, Wired for Intimacy. And then ask this question, have you made this kind of covenant that Job made, that, that Job of all people is godly and as righteous as Job was, that he considered important for his own godliness, a covenant with his eyes, and if you have made that kind of commitment, are you in a Christ-centered group of support that will strengthen that commitment? To see how deadly lust is, we just need to look what happened to David. The, the longer he looked at this woman, the more he wanted her. Sin was taking control, and as David began to fantasize, he felt unable to turn away. Rather than fleeing from temptation, you know, like Joseph did when Potiphar's wife grabbed him and wanted to have sex with him. David instead began to do what the Bible tells us not to do. He began, this is the way Paul talks in Romans 13, he began to think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. We're called to do exactly the opposite. Think about how not to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And let me just say that David did not have to give in to this temptation. At any point in this sequence, he could have stepped away. In fact, the Bible gives this amazing promise. I wonder if you believe it. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3, uh, verse 13. And if we doubt that promise, it is probably because we have never really tested it. We've just given in to temptation long before getting to that place where we see the way of escape. We haven't found the exit strategy that God has for us, but that way of escape is always there. This is the promise of God. In any tempting situation, there is a promise to believe. There is a friend that we could call. There is a spirit who will come and help us when we pray. And so you might consider the next time you are committed, attempted to commit the sin that keeps dragging you down, to do this, to pray out loud and say, Lord Jesus, I am being tempted to this sin. Help me see the way out. You pray that. Invite the Lord Jesus himself by his spirit right into that situation of temptation, and he will show the way of deliverance. Oh, if only David had done that. But no, he didn't do that. He didn't look for God's way of escape. He started toying with the, with the possibilities. And I believe this is what lust is. It is looking at a man or looking at a woman and imagining the sexual possibilities. In this case, the woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her, and someone said, it's not entirely clear whether somebody even had to go and find out about her or if it was simply common knowledge, this is Bathsheba. She's the daughter of Eliam. She is the wife of Uriah. Obviously, the whole thing should end right there. One commentator observes that this double identification reinforces how much she cannot belong to David. She is a woman with both a husband and a father. She is cared for and protected, hands off. Any further thought of this was totally out of the question for a man of God. But David wanted to have her. It's the way that lust works. It takes on a life of its own. It pulls us in deeper and deeper until we feel as if we are powerless to resist. And since David was the king, he could do what most people could only dream of doing. If he wanted a woman, he could have her. And so the Bible says he fetched Bathsheba. It seemed perhaps like such a small thing, only a, a moment of weakness, nothing more than that. But 
Wouldn't you know it, Bathsheba was pregnant. And one thing led to another. By the time David was finished summoning noble Uriah back to Jerusalem, getting him drunk, sending him back to the army with what amounted to a death sentence, it was much more than a sex scandal. Bathsheba's husband was dead. Oh, how sad this verse is that Bathsheba lamented over her husband. David had become a felon. He was guilty of adultery, deceit, theft, murder. You read the, the commentators, it's hard for them even to agree on how many sins actually are committed here, but the whole cover-up is much worse than the crime. And for a while, it seemed as if David would get away with murder. One commentator imagines him feeling, and maybe some of us know the feeling, that slightly uneasy but a little bit exhilarated sense that you've gotten away with something. I mean, sure, he had to scramble a little bit to make it happen, but everything went according to plan, all tidied up. Except for this, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. That's the last word in chapter 11. And perhaps if we are wise, we will ask ourselves this question, what sin am I trying to cover up? I cannot imagine that God does not know what I did, concealing our sin is futile in the sight of an all-knowing God. If you, if you did something to displease him, you may be sure that he knows all about it. I like what Solomon said on this very subject. He says, why should you be intoxicated, my son, with an adulteress? For man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all your paths. So what should David do now? Well, when trouble first came in the form of deadly temptation, he gave right in, and now he was in a lot more trouble than he was in when things began. And deep down somewhere, he must have known this. He must have sensed there was no way out for him. You know, if anyone should have known what to do in a time of trouble, it was David. He had been in trouble many times before. And whenever he was in trouble, David prayed for God to deliver him. There are all of these prayers for deliverance in the Psalms. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is no one to help. The troubles of my heart are enlar enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. This is the way that David so often prayed. And yet this time we hear nothing from the man. Nothing, that is, until... The Lord, in his grace, sent someone who loved him to confront him. A true spiritual friend. Thank God David had somebody in his life who cared enough to confront. You know, we, we live in a culture that believes love means never having to tell anyone that they're wrong. That's not what Nathan the prophet believed. No, he loved David well enough to tell him that he was a sinner. And he did it so cleverly, too. It was, it was a kind of spiritual judo in which Nathan uses the weight of David's own opinion against himself and gets the king to render judgment before he even knows the identity of the accused. He, Nathan tells this parable of injustice about this wealthy stockholder stealing a poor man's only lamb and serving it for dinner. And that story penetrated David's defenses. It captured his conscience as a righteous king. He was ready to put the rich man to death right away. David's indignation was the perfect setup for Nathan's signature line. You're the man, he said. And then the prophet outlined David's transgressions in painful detail. Nathan reminded him, you were anointed as the king, David. God rescued your life from many enemies. He established your kingdom. He gave you houses and lands with, with women to spare and what have you done? You have utterly scorned the Lord. And Nathan pronounced judgment on the house of David. Oh, how disgraced he was. But there is one thing, one thing that David did right. It's, I think, the only thing in the entire story that he does right. And that is to confess his sin. You're right, Nathan, he said. I am the man. Or as the Bible quotes him, I have sinned against the Lord. If you want the fuller words of David's confession, they're in Psalm 51, that song of painful beauty. 
in which David does not make any excuses. He doesn't pretend that God doesn't know what God does in fact know. He sees his sin for what it is and he is man enough to admit it. And God has mercy on people like that. He took away David's sin. This was the word of assurance that Nathan gave to David right as he confessed his sin. If you read Psalm 51, you know how the Lord renewed David's hope and restored his faith and created in him a clean heart, how, da how the Lord renewed his spirit even after all of the things that David had done. This was God's grace for David. By the time he gets to the end of Psalm 51, he is ready to worship God. Oh Lord, he says, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. More than anyone else in the Bible, David declares God's mercy to us and declares God's deliverance in our troubles. This is the, why well, I've chosen for our year verse this year, a verse that comes from one of the Psalms of David. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold. He is your stronghold in time of trouble. Do you believe this promise? It may be hard to believe if some particular sin seems to dominate your life. But understand, if you feel powerless, you are in just the right place to experience the power of God. You know that sin management will not make any difference to sanctification in your life. It will have to come from a power outside of you. Put your faith in God and you will find true freedom. When you, when you find that you are in sin, don't turn away from the cross. Run towards it. And there you will meet the Savior who never sinned, not even once. But I won't say that he wasn't tempted, because he was, including in every way. The Bible says he was tempted in every respect, just as we are, in, just as David was. Lust, adultery, falsehood, murder, those were all sins that were tempting for Jesus in one way or another. What a great mystery. But he found the way to escape all of those dangers, and as a result, his death on the cross is a perfect sacrifice. And now the crucified, risen Lord Jesus offers us forgiveness and freedom. There are many things that can help us in our struggle with sin, including our struggle with the temptation to sexual sin. There are promises from Scripture, accountability partners, addiction recovery groups, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I can think of a lot of things that have their place and the purposes of God to strengthen us in our struggle with sin. But the main thing is simply this, repentance, openly confessing our sin, and then faith, holding onto the cross and believing in the mercy of Jesus. What brings spiritual change is the gospel. And everyone who believes this gospel receives the blessing that David once received, that David once gave. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Now we're gonna close our worship this morning in prayer. I'm gonna invite Stuart to come forward now. He's going to sing for us Psalm 13, and it's partly a psalm of prayer in time of distress and trouble. It's also a psalm that ends with a strong, uh, strong affirmation of the salvation of our God. Psalm 13.
my enemies say, I have overcome him.